through the lovely sheep, who I think they might think I've come to feed them. Either that or they're not very happy with me at all. <laughs> I used to quite like Mr. Sawyer. He te he teached, he taught. No, no, you were on um, the first time. <laughs> Why? Oh. Great. Well, that's because if you don't concentrate, Mr. Cunningham throws a cricket ball at you, and you have to lift the lid up fast to block the cricket ball. I'll forget that. You know, for example, if she goes into a shop to choose a new soft toy, she will choose the one that's either the last of something, so it's by itself, or its eyes are a bit squiffy, or do you know what I mean? She'll choose the one that she thinks no one else will want. She's it's really like, interesting because you adopted the same approach to choosing a husband. <laughs> now, initially, this house was lived in. No, 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 no. no. Welcome, everybody, to the Bakery Bears video show featuring my brand new t-shirt. Oh, right. Isn't it great? I Look love at it. This. <laughs> a Land Rover Defender, which is what this is, if you didn't know. I love the fact that she <laughs> came with my project back, because that is, of course, blocking the t-shirt. I couldn't see the t-shirt on the screen. Oh, OK. All right. Um, You're not supposed to be watching the telly, dear. I'm sorry. No, a Land Rover Defender is like my dream country car. Yeah. I really want one. Although one they've changed the design now, haven't they? And I the iconic design is no longer. It's gone all modern. The design, which I don't been really like it, as pretty much. much unchanged since World War Two. I know. Amazing. I don't like the new one. I'm talking about an old one, and I really want a pink one. Shall I make a prediction? My dream is to have a pink Land Rover Defender. I think if you're driving you, around the country. I think if you sat in one, I think you probably would. I know. Like it. Oh, if I would want one. I think you would quite like them. Oh, really? Not that we'd ever have the I've money to afford one. No, I was going to say, no, I've never sat in one. No. We're not talking about that. No. We're talking about my amazing T-shirt. It's a great T-shirt. Now, of course, the show is not just featuring my amazing T-shirt. No. Because, yes, Walking the Wall is back. It is. Now, we launched this series in January. And if you recall, on that walk, I told you a little story about a trip that I took 35 years ago mm -hmm. that was the seed which became my lifelong love of history. Yep. Well, on today's walk, we're only gonna walk straight past the place that I visited. I can even remember the teacher who planned the trip. Wow. Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Cunningham. Philip Cunningham. Now, Philip Cunningham used to teach history, funnily enough, and he, if you weren't concentrating, I may have mentioned this before, oh, he's yeah. the one who used to throw cricket balls at you. Excellent. When I walked in to sit, you know, sit down, oh, Mr. Cunningham, <laughs> junior history teacher, why are there circular divots in the desks? Well, that's because if you don't concentrate, Mr. Cunningham throws a cricket ball at you and you have to lift the lid up fast to block the cricket ball. Either that or you catch the cricket ball. <laughs> Times have changed, obviously. Now, other teachers used to throw the board rubber. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that, for me, that's worse. No, it's not. A board rubber, a piece of wood, that's a lot different to a cricket ball, which I, is like... I'd rather be able to catch a circular missile. ball than have a sort of spinning... Yeah, but if a, if a cricket ball hits you, it's going to be worse than a board rubber. I remember a couple of times the board rubber being thrown at me, and I it's, caught it uh, in midair. And because it's a board rubber, I was, covered, dust. I was covered in dust. It's the chalk dust that's a nightmare, isn't it? I was it, instantly aged yeah. by 50 years. <laughs> Do you remember any of your school teachers? Yes. No, no, not the one that you had the crush on. Oh, I did have a crush on a couple of my teachers, actually. And, well, a couple? Don't girls do that? I don't know. I thought girls did that. <laughs> my geography teacher right. had a bit of a crush on. He was right. also my form teacher, which actually I found mortifying when I found out, because I'm like, oh, no, I've got to see him every single day, and he's really handsome. Thinking back... But you have to see me every day, and I'm really... <laughs> <laughs> Thinking back, though, I, I don't think he actually was that handsome. Right, it's like me. I can still remember what he looked like, I can and his name and everything. I can remember what he looked like, but yeah, I mean, so, rose -tinted did, you, did you say what his name was? Again? Oh, new glasses, everybody, new glasses. What, what was his name again? Mister Leadham. Oh, you hadn't said. You hadn't said. No, I hadn't said. And who's the other teacher you had the crush on? 
Well, Mr. Sawyer, I used to quite like Mr. Sawyer. He te- he teached, he taught... No, no, you were right um, the first time. <laughs> was he physics or chemistry? <laughs> he always used to walk around in a white lab coat. Do you know the teachers that did that? Yes, I remember those. Even when he wasn't teaching, he always wore a white lab coat. He actually subsequently went Mr. on used to do and that became head school. teacher oh, at the wait. school. Right. I think that's right. No, Mr. Sawyer. No, I'm getting it confused. Mr. Sawyer was a maths teacher. Right. It wasn't Mr. Sawyer I had a crush on. It was Mr. Campbell. Right. Mr. Campbell was the physics stroke chemistry teacher. Right. Hey, look, thank you all so much for your... We've had so many messages about the last show, and it's been wonderful to see all your cottage pies appearing. Yes. They've been everywhere. They have. There's been like a surge in cottage pie making. Yes. I think Shepherd's Pie also has perhaps made yeah, some I know, appearances too. Yeah, that's right. I mean, co- the, w- the using of the words Shepherd's Pie and Cottage Pie, I think a lot of people just call it Shepherd's Pie when it's not got lamb in it. It's fine, isn't it? Why would a shepherd make a pie without... Oh, maybe they want to protect their sheep. Maybe that makes sense. Maybe they would, but I, I would guess that most... I would, I would use them for most, spinning. Most shepherds would probably eat their own sheep. I think sheep. that's the reason why it's called shepherd's yeah, pie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have thought so. And I've been such a lucky boy this last week because mm. we had a special family birthday for a, a very special family member at the we weekend. Did. We did. And in the last week, I've only had two loaves of spelt bread. <sighs> I made an extra loaf of spelt bread because um, deciding what to have when she was here for sort of like a little birthday celebration. It went all festive. It did go a bit festive because we used to eat that on. Yeah, yeah, we had Christmas sort of a, we had sort of a main meal at lunchtime, but then then we had a little sort of afternoon tea-ish thing about half four, five o'clock. I decided to bake a spelt loaf that morning. I roasted a chicken. And we had um, like hot roast chicken sandwiches with stuffing. You yes. made some stuffing. I it's gluten free stuffing. It's yes, excellent, yes. actually. It's yes. by Mrs. It? Crimble. Mrs. Crimble. It's all Christmassy, this. Ah. <laughs> Mrs. Crimble stuffing, sage and onion. It's really good. Very good. So we had hot roast chicken sandwiches on spelt bread. And then I made some little mini Victoria sponges. Delicious. <gasps> Again, with spelt flour. Would you believe? Absolutely brilliant. You made mini Victoria sponges. And this week, we have been publishing for our Baker Bear patrons. We've been going back through re-editing and republishing our original What's in Your Oven series, yeah. which was broadcast 2015, and the episode, it was the final episode oh, that's in the series. Made. It's made Victoria Sponges. Yeah, I have made it, and you can go and watch it, but I replaced the self-raising flour with spelt flour and then baking powder. Amazing. Um, and they were amazing. absolutely amazing. They were. I like and to I have used mine. the jam we made. Yes, yes. I used the jam. I like to have yep. mine with cream. He does. A lot of I mean, cream. There's buttercream in there, so I made buttercream. I whipped it up really. And then you really. stick it in a bowl Ooh, and you the literally... The buttercream was light and fluffy. You told me off for buying uh, too much cream, but I did have most of it. I bought this massive tub of cream. So, yeah. It, oh, and I also, that same day at lunchtime, we had the syrup sponge pudding. Amazing. From what a day of food. In your oven. What a day of food it made was. Made with spelt flour, of course. Yeah. So yeah. I could have two portions and feel fine the next day. I did. It was Perfect. great. It was a day of spelt flour and tummies were fine. It was great. But look, we have too much in store for you today. We do, because we do. in the course of today's show, we've got the most amazing pattern launch in the history of the yes. world. Yes. Kay's pattern been. Pattern launch. I think more the, 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 the thing is, I've never seen you quite so sort of engrossed and enjoying. A project than, than I loved these. Them. I so loved they're them. They're coming later on the show, yes. and also in today's show, we're going to establish that I'm a total idiot. If you didn't know that already, so I think it's time that I shut up, actually, and I asked you, Kay Jones, what's on your needles? Yes. I've got three new cast-ons, and the first new cast-on. This one is very exciting. It's in my, as you know by now, my very favourite Moo and Mouse. Halloween bag. There's a story behind this. It's a pair of socks and I've finished one of them actually already. It literally flew off my needles and I've got the second one cast on. Now the story to these socks is that in early July this year, Bryony has got her school year 11 prom. The concept of having a prom in England to me it seems completely like alien. I can't, I still can't quite get my head around it because this is not something that ever was a thing until recent years, isn't yeah, it? Really, we know exactly what happened it, 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 when we were at school. We used to have school discos, yeah, school we discos. didn't just have one, 
No, we had loads. End. We had well, a school but, disco definitely every year. Yeah, yeah. Dance, you know. I don't remember a, a huge event at the end of like fifth form, which is what it would have been in there our wasn't, day. There, there wasn't. wasn't. But, but, but every year we did have a school disco. We had a school disco and too. It was normally I used finger to take sandwiches. Records in. Get on. Double. On. I I always took in. I know this one. And I had a few Hits. of the na- no now. Oh, okay. That's what I call music. I had like number three or something. Well, that's how long ago it somewhere. is. And it was like a double. LP, it opened up like that. And right. we all used to take in our favourite records for the disco. They don't do that now. Sadly, you know, I was a shame. School <laughs> discos were great. School discos were... They were great. But yeah. we looked this up and it was in the early 2000s. Yes. When, because lots of English teenagers were watching uh, American TV shows yeah. and hearing about proms, yeah. a school decided to do a prom. To do a prom. And then it and spread yeah. across the country. Now everybody does them, don't they? So when they School discos of, are gone. The school discos are gone. Um, do you know, there's something to be said for tradition, isn't there? And I, I wish it was still a, st- a school disco. But, because you've you got know, to have more than one. There's nothing, yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. It's proms and that's it. So... Anyway, she's got her prom at the beginning of July, and they've obviously not had proms the last couple of years. So, you know, the whole... It, it's not just you've just got to take her and drop her off and then that's it. No, no, we've got to do the dress. We've got to do everything associated <laughs> with the prom. So Bryony decided she wanted to go full-on princess dress type thing. So we had a look around and we actually got a one online. She wanted a big sort of, you know, a, a big skirt down to the floor, swishy thing that she could swish. She wanted something where it had got sleeves because she doesn't really like, you know, she didn't want one of these little skimpy dresses that you see a lot of teenagers in. She's not that kind of girl at all. She did want something with um, a sleeve. So anyway, we found her. Uh, the perfect dress online and I ordered it and it didn't quite fit properly. It looks amazing, it fit her quite well around the waist and the bottom was all fine but at the top here it was just way too big. It was literally falling off. The top portion is like a sort of um, lace and the sleeves are lace with tiny little buttons, it's beautiful. And then it's got a big full skirt with underskirts underneath it, you know, like net and underskirts. It's actually in a bridal shop at the minute, getting its first adjustment. We had to go, we had to find a bridal shop, which in itself was a task, you actually did it for me. Dan rang around a few bridal shops to see whether they would do adjustments to prom dresses. It was really difficult because a lot of them will only do it if you have bought the dress from them, but then other ones were just solidly booked. I think again because Covid the last couple of years, weddings have been delayed and everything and now is this resurgence of weddings and everybody's just booked up. But luckily we managed to find one. So we went a few weeks ago for a first fitting and they were lovely. Yeah, I was really intimidated and Bryony kind of was a bit as well. But you know, she put the dress on, the ladies were lovely. I was worried that I was gonna go in and it was gonna be like 20 year old, you know, model type people that were running it. It wasn't like that at all. It was too really yeah, that's lovely. Because we don't live in Knightsbridge. Yeah, I know. I don't know why I had this image in my head. But anyway, they were lovely. And we did the first fitting and they're, they're lifting the shoulders is the first thing they're doing. So they're taking a load of fabric out of the shoulder and lifting it up. So they're doing that and then we're going back actually on Saturday for a second fitting where they'll put it on again, they'll see what's going on and then see if the length needs adjusting and see if any sort of um, fabric off the waist needs taking off. So that's all being done. The colour of her dress, she actually decided in the end on a peacock blue, it's like a deep peacock blue. It's beautiful, it's gorgeous and it really suits her, it's the right sort of colour for her. On her feet, this is where I come to the pair of socks. <laughs> Finally, you're saying, she's come to the pair of socks. But because she's so tall, she's like five foot ten, she decided she was going to go like really cool with this and what we've actually got for her is just like a little plain pair of kind of trainers trainer yeah just plain white canvas flat with laces and she's actually going to draw on them she's going to decorate them i thought right okay this is my opportunity to knit Bryony a pair of socks to wear to a prom why not so 
The next stage was to find a colour of yarn and in the end I dyed up some yarn. So although her dress is, like I said, it's like a peacock blue, in fact I'll show you, it's kind of matches and this is the colour that I'll be dyeing next time actually on my favourite colourways. This is Hobbitland. This is the sort of shade, that sort of general colour of that greeny blue shade, you know, the peacocky blue. So this is Hobbitland. This is the yarn I'm actually knitting her socks with. I took all of the colours that I used in Hobbitland and I dyed them in a different way to produce this gorgeous colour. So you can actually tell, I think, that they're the same dye colours in there because they're so well coordinated. But I just thought that sort of Rather than matchy-matchy, I think it would be nice to have something that's related, but not exactly the same. So yeah, this is the colour that I dyed up. It's gorgeous, isn't it? It's lovely. It's like a kind of, I don't know, sea foamy sort of colour, maybe? Really, really pretty. And I've designed a sock. And, you know, she'll wear them to the prom and then she can obviously wear them afterwards. So I've finished a sock. I've just cast on the second. This hasn't been blocked yet. But here is Bryony's prom socks. Oh, I love them so much. So I came up with this really gorgeous lace stitch. Oh, I love it. Don't they look lovely? And I've just done the whole sock in the yarn. I didn't want to, I just wanted the yarn to shine and I wanted, you know, the pattern. I just wanted to do it all in one colour and I really love socks done all in one colour like this. I think they've got a lot of impact. So I've just literally cast on the second one, I've just got the cuff. And the best news, I think the best news is that I am going to release this as a design and I've called them Prom Queen. Amazingly, when I looked on Ravelry, the only design that was called Prom Queen was a little Barbie dress. No other design was called Prom Queen. There was one pair of socks, I think it was called something like Zombie Prom Queen or something. But uh, these, these are just going to be the Prom Queen. I just think they're so lovely. And it, this pattern literally flew off my needles. It's just the loveliest thing to knit. So I'm on with the second one. And, you know, I'll just work through the process of releasing these as a pattern. But isn't the yarn just lovely? Oh, I love it. So it's got lots of tones in. And the pattern, isn't it? Oh, just, I'm just crazy. So they're like dresses? They're yes, like skirts? They do look a bit... If you look at the little lace, it looks like little sort of yeah. full skirts running down. Which is where I got sort of my inspiration from because she's got this big full skirt. She looked great in the dress, actually. I had a bit of a play around with heel turns because I I use, when I do a heel flap, I always use the same heel turn. And I thought for this one, let's just have a play around. And I did a swatch of a few different heel turns. Actually, I concluded that the one that I always put into my patterns is my favorite. The one that I use, I designed it to be more heel shaped. I think it's a bit more heel shaped. You can get heel turns where they're very triangular up here. You know, when you look at them, they come to quite a point. But your heel doesn't do that, does it? Your heel is more like that. And that's what my heel turns are more like. I'll show you. Can you see how it's, to me, it's more of a heel shape. Some of them are very pointed just here. But it was a really useful exercise to just spend a bit of time looking at different heel turns because you do sometimes wonder if, you know, the thing that you use is the best thing for you and I think it's always good to explore other things. But I was really glad. I spent a couple of hours just swatching different heel turns and concluded that actually the one I use is my favourite. But I'm using some needles that I'm kind of revisiting I've been doing that lately because, you know, I had that issue with, although I love the Chowgu mini twists, that really thin cable just causes that line, which I don't like, that tight line. So I've been trying, going sort of back in time and trying a few needles and I'm actually using Addy lace. I think they might, in this country, we buy them as just Addy, Addy lace needles. They look like this. But I think they're also known as sock rockets in other countries. Maybe the US, they might be known as sock rockets. But I'm really loving them. They're a great needle. 
nice and smooth here. The cable's fine, not having any issues with them and the tips are lovely. So I'm really enjoying using those. So that's my prom queen socks and I'll obviously keep you posted on the progress of those for Bryony's upcoming prom. Anyway, Dan Jones. Yes. What's on your needles? It's the star mittens, isn't it? I'm sure that's what they're called. I just end up getting so engrossed. Yeah, engrossed. It is. Star. It's the star mittens. And there is, so this is another mitten. Oh. And there's the front. And there is the back. I love this bit here. That's really fun. Mm -hmm. I love doing the increases, but the, the, the patterning on the palm is just great fun. And the, you know, for all the issues I've had with Latvian braids, when it's described to me in short sentences, I can do them just fine, thanks very much. Because there is a perfect Latvian braid. And yeah, it's a markedly better quality job by me than on the first one that I did. And the reason for that is, I mean, I can show you if you look. I mean, mm. you can just sort of tell straight away. I mean, look, look how big that stitch is. So basically, what's happened is in this run going across, I've messed up the float and I've ended up with a big stitch there. Similarly, up here, it's when you get these, these runs of a few and then you've got a couple of sort of spots of color work, I've just messed up the floating. And for, for me, I think when you're knitting with a new yarn, which this was for me, it takes you a bit of time just to work out how it's going to behave. For me, it does anyway, how it's going to behave. So it's only by doing that. I mean, you can see the difference as, well, you see, you can on one side, but not on the other. Because look, you know, that's that's really not great there. Again, it's in one of those sections, but definitely as I, but oh, and you see there, there's mistakes too. Look, 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 I missed oh, yeah. one of the yeah. spots on the side. So this first, Mitt. And there's a mistake somewhere down here, isn't there as well? There, look. Yes. Yeah, I, I got the row. I just did yeah, the row wrong. Yeah. Who knows what I was doing. Uh, and also, Kate had to do the backwards loop cast on, yeah. which when I do it, it, it's like Kay's watching the funniest like comedy show ever. <laughs> he had to film me. It just it wouldn't go in your head. I kept showing you how to do it. And I think it's a simple thing, a backwards loop cast on. It is a simple thing. But it just wasn't going in his head Because I was making it more complex than what it is. So he's like, right, do it again. I'm going to get my phone and I'm going to film you. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing. I said, all right, okay. So, so now you have to watch it back every yeah, time you do it. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at this, so so there's there's two lovely mittens. Oh, there we go. You got it right in the end. Uh, two lovely mittens will do spot the ball, spot the difference. Yeah. Do you remember that? Spot I remember, the ball. Remember my yeah. gran. I used to do spot okay. the ball with my dad. Did yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never used to win. I don't think I ever used to win. My grand had never let me do it. Oh, my dad let us do it sometimes. She took it too seriously. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but look, there we go. So see if you can uh, spot the ball. Spot the problem with these mitts. Okay, here we go. Can you see? Give them a minute. Give them a minute. Who's got it? Shout if you've got it. Put your hands up. Shout out if you can see what the issue is with you, these two. You better have your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I've done the right one twice. <laughs> It's okay. I'll just wear one back to front. Would that even work? I don't know. No. No, because the thumb is coming out of here. So what if I turned it upside down? It wouldn't down? work. It, it wouldn't, wouldn't work. work. No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work, work, work because the thumb is coming out of here. Yeah, but yeah, actually, yeah. it is pretty cool because if you think about it, if you look at your hand, look at your hand, just hold your no, hand out. These are left ones that you've done. Okay. So I need to do the right one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a left. But if you look at how your thumb comes out of your hand, you know, yeah. when you consider lots of sort of glove patterns tend to be more like this. Yes. Actually, mm. this is more, I mean, it's maybe too much the other way. It maybe needs to be like somewhere in the middle. But anyway, yeah, anyway. Yeah, it doesn't work with the other hand. That's just the design of, of the mitts, which I absolutely love. But look, I've come to the conclusion. The knitting job on this is so much better. I mean, like so much better. And also I did the backwards loop castle mm. and I uh, stuck all my stitches on. Uh, waste yarn. Mm -hmm. I did it all myself. I've not made any mistakes to this point. So I came to the conclusion after I checked that we had <laughs> extra yarn that I'm just going to keep on knitting this. This is a test run. Yes. So I'll knit this and then I'll knit the right mitten. Yep. That is the conclusion I've come to. Now I'll tell you another story and that is this. When I realised I'd done it 
I, I, I sat on the sofa, we were watching some true crime thing. Right. Um, sat on the sofa, and I realised I'd done it. I was so ashamed, I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like looking at it, and then I just put it away. I'm like, you complete idiot. And then I was taking out of sobriety school the next morning, and I said, oh. I've made a complete mess up on some bits that I'm making and I've got to bug up the courage to tell them that. <laughs> it was really funny. But I don't it, know what you think I was going to say. <laughs> what, I, I, what, I didn't react badly, did I? No, of course not. I just, but look, I just felt sorry for you. I, the thing is, though, I said to Brian, I don't mind. I don't mind having to knit a third mitt because that was the first mitt, uh, first, you know, Latvian colourwork mitt I've ever knitted in my life. So I think it's fair to say mm. it's cool that that was a trial run. I agree. So this is the first proper one. And I've, I will tell you now, I love it. Mm. Every single bit of it, I absolutely love. I love the challenge of having to cast off the thumb stitches of the increases. Mm. I love the having to do the backwards loop cast on, literally the hardest cast on ever, having to do that. <laughs> Anyone who can do that is a genius, in my opinion. And I love, I love what it's creating. It's mm. right up my alley. Mm. So I've got no problem at all in getting through this mitt. Because actually, I got through that actually quite quickly. Yeah, you did. Because this you had did. sort of been, because I've been very focused on jumpers and the fingering, yeah, yeah. The, the fingering weight mitt that I'm also knitting. I got through that quite quick. So I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to get that one finished. I'm going to get through the, the, the right mm. one. The right one. And then... Perfect. It'll be all ready for Kay when it gets cold again. Yes. Bring it on. Because, you know, it's too warm now for mittens anyway. But So that is um, my star mitt. I highly recommend the pattern. And the yarn that you're using, you he, you would have had enough with two 50 gram balls to make the pair. Yes. Because that's what you're working with yes, currently. Yes. So you definitely would have had enough to make the pair. Yes. But we, I did have another ball of each of the, the colours, so yeah. it's all fine. But it's the very lovely... Blacker Yarns, Blacker Swan DK, the Falklands Island Merino. And the grey colour is Pale Maiden. And the sort of chestnutty colour is Hawkweed. And this yarn, I've said before, but this yarn is one of my absolute favourites. I I'd knit and designed a cowl with this, which was the Harbour Cowl, which was a platinum pattern. I wore it actually the other day. I've wore it a few times because it's down near the front door and if I forget to bring one down, I just put it on and it's the most soft, gorgeous thing. That cowl was my go-to cowl through walking yeah, the it's dales. It's such beautiful yarn. It does pill a little bit because it's merino, mainly merino. It does have a bit of Shetland spun with it. You know, it's mostly merino, and but I don't, I don't mind if something pills. I, you know, that's the nature of merino, isn't it, at the end of the day? I don't mind that at all. It's gorgeous yarn, beautiful colours, beautiful to knit with. What else is on your needles? Right. Well, this is another project for Bryony, actually. A few times, actually, Bryony has worn a few of my cowls and just suddenly dawned on me the other day that she didn't have her own cowl. She does have a couple of scarves, three scarves, actually, that I've knit her, that she wears for schools. The one she wears most often is the Hufflepuff one that I made years ago. It's really, you know, it really is coming towards the end of its life, I think, but she still wears it. And then I knit her one, which was in BTS colours that I dyed up. And then I knit her another one, which was yarn, um, it was Starry Night, wasn't it? It was like navy blue with speckles in. But I've never knit her a cowl, and she had one of mine on the other day, and she said she liked it. I said, oh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, you know, now that you're heading towards sixth form and you get to wear your own clothes, I will make you your own cowl to wear for this coming winter. So she chose the owl cowl. That's the design of mine that she wanted. The owl cowl is a free pattern of mine. This is the original one. So it uses six mini skeins and then a full skein of yarn as well. You don't use anywhere near the full skein, but you know, it's a full skein just for the sort of in between colors. And it's got a garter rib at the bottom and then each colour is separated by this little texture sort of pattern here and I thought the little eyelets looked like an owl's face so hence the owl cow so this was the first one that I made and this is knit from 
The main colour, the brown colour, was an Eden Cottage yarn. I can't remember the colourway, sadly. And then this was a set... Oh, I can't remember the name of the dyer, but it, it's on the design page. It's on the project page on Ravelry and Lovecrafts as well. You can get it free on Ravelry and Lovecrafts. So this was the first one I knit. And then I knit another one. I had a skein of fairy lights from Hedro Yarn, which is this gorgeous yarn. Oh, so lovely. The speckles are amazing. And then I dyed up these three neon colours. So I did a sort of 80s version, which is just lovely. And I wear all of, I wear both of these really regularly. But Bryony wanted the brief, she wanted brown and she wanted a gradient of blues within it. She loves brown. And I think the reason actually she loves brown is she thinks it's a highly underrated colour and she tends to cheer on the underdog, if you like. You know, any anything in terms of, you know, for example, if she goes into a shop to choose a new soft toy, she'll look at every single one, probably two or three times, she'll go around the whole shop, and then she will choose the one that's either the last of something, so it's by itself, because she feels sorry for it, or if there's one she wants and there's like three of them, she'll look at all of them, or she'll choose the one that's like got a bent ear, or its eyes are a bit squiffy, or do you know what I mean? She'll choose the one that she thinks no one else will want. She's it's really hiring. interesting because you adopted the same approach to choosing a husband. <laughs> yes, I, choose the, I chose the one that no one else wanted. Oh, that's not true. It's sort of your hair colour, this, to be fair. <laughs> so that's what she wanted. Browns and a gradient of blues. So I've chosen, for the brown, I've chosen an Eden Cottage yarn again. I love Victoria's yarn. You know, I buy a lot of her yarn because she does, does such nice tonal yarns and her bases are, are lovely as well so it's Eden Cottage and this colour it's on the sparkle base which is Silverdale and this it's fingering weight and this one is twig <laughs> well it just sounds funny and Brownie chose this one I had a few browns to go at but she chose this one it's the gorgeous shade it's really lovely isn't it so that's the sort of main colour. And then I'm using six different Cascade Heritage blues. I had some of these already in stash and I bought a couple, I think, to make up the full sort of six that I needed. And this is where I'm up to. Oh, I love it, I really love it. I kind of think, oh yeah, Bryony can wear this, but I might wear it as well. So I've started down here with, this colour is navy, and it is a true navy blue, I would say. And then I've just gone into this slightly lighter, if you can see there. And this one, it's a gorgeous shade. This one is marine. Isn't that gorgeous, that blue? Oh, I love it. So yeah, that's that one. And then after that, it's gonna be difficult to hold these, but after that, I've got this one, which is denim. And that's nice. Then, yeah, it's lovely. And then I'm going into turquoise. Who's denim, by? These are all Cascade Heritage. Oh, okay. So this one is turquoise. This one is Bachelor Button. What a great name for a yarn colourway. Bachelor Button is this one. And then we're going to end with this gorgeous shade, which my little label's fallen off, but it was placid blue, I believe. So isn't it lovely? It's a lovely sort of, it's not a true gradient, really, but I just did the best I could. I love this one, the placid blue, it's just beautiful. And I've got full skeins of all of these, but I didn't have a project bag big enough to house seven full skeins of yarn, so I just wound off what I would need into a mini skein. That's just easier to sort of handle. So isn't that gonna look lovely with browns and the blues look coming through what will yeah it'll be that one and oh I can't do it but you get the you get the gist don't you it's going to be really lovely it's such a nice cow to knit you know this is the third time that I've knit it and it's just lovely you know you get loads of stocking stitch and then you just get to do a little bit of something when you change colour you get to use, you know, if you if you chose, for example, you know, you go, go in your stash and choose a favourite sort of tonal yarn for your main colour. And then, again, go in your stash and choose six mini skeins that go with it. You know, it's just, I love, you know, I've been realising recently, and I say this a lot, but I've realised even more recently that 
most of my enjoyment of knitting a project comes from the colours, the yarn and the combination of that and how I use the colour. I just love it and I think that's why I enjoy blankets so much because there's so much scope to use colour in blankets, isn't there? But yeah, I, I get so much enjoyment out of choosing the colours and deciding what you know what it's going to look like and it's funny because Bryony loves all that as well Bryony does a lot of scrapbooking and every every week weekend day she will do a new scrapbook page based on something that's in her head that day and she does it every single day when she's on holiday you know she'll do a scrapbook page and she loves placing everything you know she'll choose all her images she'll print them off she'll cut them out she'll choose washi tape and she'll choose pen colors and the whole thing will coordinate so I, you know i think she's kind of inherited that love of playing with color i hope so she's inherited it from me i don't think it's from you sadly no it isn't no right. i know that so yeah this is my owl cowl that i'm just going to carry on working through i'm not in any rush because she won't be wearing this until autumn so there's no rush. But this design uses 3.25 millimetre. That's what I use. And I always use, for like hats and cowls that use a 16 inch circular, I always use Knit Pro Nova. They're great. I've never had an issue at all. They're cheap to buy. The tips are nice. They're nice and smooth. I don't have any problems with the join. They're a great needle. So evidence number one was the mitt. This is of you being an idiot? Yes. Yes, okay. Evidence number two is, is I'm going to put before you now, my lord. I actually, I'm, I'm an idiot on many levels because in this bag I found a four and a half mil oh, you're kidding. fixed circular. Oh, you're kidding. You don't need to know why I'm saying that. Well, this will be the four and a half fixed circular that I knitted the body on right. before right. that we couldn't find. Right. It was in my bag in the pocket. I'm sorry. I told you I was an idiot. So, because I couldn't find that, well, I never even looked for it, Kate fixed me up with her interchangeables. Yes. And, and off I set... Chowgoo again. You, it was a Chowgoo interchangeable. Off so. I set knitting the Infinity slash Eternity. And for those of you who are wondering about the name, I'll put the name up at the bottom of the screen. It's linked in the show notes below. But just to confuse you... It actually references infinity and eternity mm. here. It says the infinity symbol connected circle after circle up and beyond to eternity. Ah. Uh, because we've yeah. been told by different people that this pattern means eternity Trans and infinity. Yeah. yeah. Look, whatever so I it think is. It, I think the word is used for both yes. meanings. Yes. Anyway, I cast it on using K's interchangeables and I mean you can see the damage it's done to my finger. Yeah it was sticking it's torn it was sticking. it's torn the skin up on my finger. They were really really sharp. This is the Chowgo interchangeables and what we found is that they're bad. I've used did, those before. Yeah we did a comparison. I don't know if it's just that particular needle tip but when we compare it to a fixed Chowgo fine. it's fine. That one didn't do it. It was just that particular interchangeable needle tip. It was really sharp. It was like higher, higher, sharp, sharp. Was that a new brand? <laughs> you know what I mean. Higher, higher, sharp, sharp. It, like a Perfect needle. Lace it, was, knitting. it was like a needle. Yes. And that's not a problem depending on your technique, but you push with your finger. A I lot think, of people do. I think if you have a loose tension. Yeah you're not going to have a problem. No. If you have a more robust tension... Where you've got to push along yes. and, you know, you do use you're your finger, don't you? You're going to have a problem. Yeah, yeah, yes. and I think... But it was tearing his finger to shreds. It was awful. And it was affecting everything I was doing. So I got about... Well, I got this amount of rounds in. It's about four or five rounds in. And I said to Kay, look, I can't do this. Yeah. And she felt the, the tips and really said, sharp. that's weird. So she said, you like those square ones, don't you? And I said, yes, I don't think you said exactly that. She didn't say you like those square ones. I think she said, think you I... like the Nipper and Nova Cubics, don't you? Yes. That's what and I said. I said, yes, I love those. And she said, they do circular versions. I said, I'm... well, go to the foot of our stairs. <laughs> Would you like a set, she said. And considering how good value these needles are. They were good value. I said, yes, yeah, please. Yeah, they were. So she bought me some. 
I bought him a set. Look at this. They were, I think it was like... 45 pounds. A, yeah, 43, I think it might have been. 43 pounds. 43 pounds for a set. I think that's really good for a set of interchangeables. Well, there's loads of stuff in it, and I'll and do a review. Kay wants me to do a review. Yeah, I'm a bit nervous they, about it, because I'm not good at reviews, but... It runs from a 4mm to an 8mm, so you get 4, 4.5, four 5, 5.5, 6, 7, So I'm, the ones I'm likely to get the usage from are 4, to four maybe 5.5, five depending yeah, on... Yeah, four, you'll use 4, 4.5, four 5, 5.5. Five yeah, um, and who knows? And I might use some of the higher ones for yeah. sort of blankets and things. Yeah. So. so, anyway, I slipped them over and I had a bit of a knit... And you know it, it, it's so it is so much better. This yarn is interesting to work with. It doesn't have a lot of give. It's the Rico Essentials Super Aran. It's not Givey. very stretchy. No. <laughs> no. It's the single ply. So single plies don't tend to be, do they? No. Stretchy. I think because it's quite fibrous, all the fibres just tend to sort of mm, stick together mm. and, and not really go anywhere. So anyway, look, changing them onto these needles. I mean, the first thing I noticed straight away was the, the cable is really nice. It, yeah, the, the cable's actually a colour coordinator, which is fun. It's I'll super just, fun, isn't it? Yeah, the one you're using is an orange one, I think, isn't it? Which is the 32 inch, but it's this set. Look, there's the, I kept the thingy jiggy. I mean, it, it's so much easier. And yeah, the cables. I think this is Twisted River as well that I'm doing at the bottom of here. Is and that right? Yeah. It, it, that is tight as well, isn't it? Twisted Rib. Am I right in thinking? Yes. Yes. Yeah, the sti yeah, just tight. So those are the cables. There's like a green and uh, two oranges and a red. Yeah, That's cool. you get two, two 32 inch, one of the smaller and one of the 40 inch. I can't, 24 inch, this one, isn't it? Yeah. Because the 32, I think, is most common. It's the first circular interchangeable set I've ever had. Yeah, you're very proud of it. I'm really you? excited about it because I really like these square needles. I just find them just so lovely yeah, to work with. Yeah, they're lovely. And even like with. the 8mm I mean, the, the that's a big chunky needle. I mean, the tip is pretty good. Looks like a pen. Hold it to Dan's top there. And you can see they're square. Very light. I think they must be hollow. Yeah, definitely. Really, really light, which is good, isn't it? But evidence for stupidity number two is look. Look what he's done. No, he's I Mobius. Didn't notice it. He's Mobius to everybody. It's Morpheus. I didn't notice. Was that his name in the Matrix? Yeah. yeah. There's no way that you could twist it slipping it over onto needles, is there? No, it must right. have been done at the beginning when you cast it. Because I just didn't notice. I just I, I have to concentrate when I do that. And if I concentrate yeah. I don't have a problem. What an idiot. So he's got to start again. <sighs> it's like, oh no. So that was another moment where I was like totally ashamed. But then I just came to the conclusion that actually, because I'd had to push and pull this so much, because of that needle, mm. it, it, it's I, sort of pilly. It looks pilly already. Well, I think it looks bad because of the fact that I was mm. knitting it on that other mm. needle. Because it just was awful. I was having mm. to move the yarn like this, mm. whereas normally I'd have been moving the needles. Mm. So it just made sense. Just you know, it's hardly any progress at all, is no, it? No, it's just but a shame. Isn't it? I thought you might like to see some of the colours. Look, look at the humongous bag of yarn. So this is lower. I can't remember the colourway names. This one might have been lemon. This is but, pink panther. Well, look. Let's just. It's not pink panther. That's not what it says. <laughs> right. Let's just hold the colours. This is sky blue. He's just making up, don't say that, you're just making up the colourway names, you're going to confuse people. But look, these are the shades for the yoke. They look Gorgeous. A, I mean, they probably look a little bit crazy at the moment, just held like that, but actually when you... When it you works sort of, brilliant. Yeah, when you pair them with the blue, I think it's going to be really nice. And there's a cream as well. And the, I think the... It's really soft. It's the fact super, that it's a gradient soft. through as well, I think that's it's that. not a gradient. But... It, it's not a great, well, but all it, different colours. They are different, but I didn't mean a great. I mean, it, 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 it's not colour work in the way that colour work is normally done. No. It becomes the background colour. Yes. And the main colour flows right the way through as the colour work. Yeah, but the yarn's lovely. There it is. So that's my yarn. There you go. That's the first Put time. Put it back in your gigantic bag of yarn. My gigantic bag of hessians. It's my. It's the first time I've ever shown you yarn. In 195 episodes. Wow. I've never brought out a bag before and said, this is the yarn that I'm using for That's the project. That's amazing. 
For those of you who may have noticed something weird on my face, Kay's just realised I must have cut myself when I was out <laughs> running. And I must admit, I did run through bushes today. So I must have, yeah, I must so, have caught myself. Yeah. It's really weird when I go out. You often come back with scratches of random cuts and... Yeah. I mean, my, my it's nerve, like when you run through brambles and things. I don't think my nerves, though, are quite what they were. No. I, I mean, br- certainly on your neck here, you still can't feel anything where your scar is, and, can and you? And you said it was here. Yeah, it's there. So that's probably got something to do with that. Anyway, anyway. apologies. <laughs> apologies for the cut on the face if you noticed it. They'll all be scrolling back now and trying I'm to zoom in. <laughs> trying to zoom in and see it. What else is on your needles? Right. Oh, yes, now... This is another exciting sock cast on. I've mentioned, I think on the last episode, that I'm going to be running in the summer. I'm doing a hand embroidery course for our patrons, the Stitchy You. But it dawned on us, me and Dan were talking, we have high powered meetings, don't we? (laughs) What we do is we just look at we look at what we're producing. <laughs> yeah. And, and the content that we put out are, are all our content, to be honest. I mean, a, a, every bit of it is, you know, planned and thought through and, you know, what we're going to put out when. And yeah. we realised that whilst we'd done some sock knitting courses as part of the Knitting University, yeah. we hadn't just done a straightforward sock tutorial series yeah. for a little while. Yeah, and because we're doing the Stitcher You, which is something entirely different, you know, for, through the summer, I, you know, we appreciate that not everybody might want to join in with that. So, you know, seeing this gap in the sort of catalogue, that right, okay, let's do a little sock tutorial course. And Specifically... Lace. Lace. Because you'd only ever done one of those before. Yeah. And it was a long time ago. Yeah. And yeah. our filming techniques have improved dramatically yes. since then. Yes. And also, you, you didn't design no. the sock for the course no, this, last time. Yeah, this is a sock I've designed. And so we'll be running this May, June. Is that what we decided? It, 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 basically, it will run into... The stitchy year. Yes. So, so, yeah, it'll be... I think it, towards the end of May through June. Yeah, think, yeah, yeah, I think that's what it will be. So, yeah, so I set about designing a sock that had got lace in it. Now, there's two ways you can go about this. You can have an all-over lace pattern, or you can just sort of focus in and have a, a panel or just, an, you know, an area that's got lace, like the front of the sock could just be lace and the back could be plain. There's lots of different things you can do. And because I wanted this to be kind of a step up from previous lace things that I've done, I, I really wanted it to include some stitches that were a bit more challenging, let's say. So I went looking through all of my stitch dictionaries and I came across a motif in... It's actually in, I've got quite a few Japanese stitch dictionaries. There's one that a lot of people have that's been used, um, you know, and shown quite regularly, but I've actually found a few others. And one of them is this one here. I found this one really difficult to find. It's a beautiful book. It, you know, when I, when I got this and I started flicking through, I was like, oh. oh, I want to knit all of these. It's a beautiful book. I found this motif. And I looked at the, because it's just charted, and I, I looked at the symbols, the symbols just blew my mind. I looked at the key, and I really struggled to understand what some of the stitches were. And I did swatch things a few times and trying to work out, and I was like, it's not that, that looks nothing like it. And then I remembered, and I thought, you know what, I think I've seen this motif somewhere else in another stitch dictionary. So I spent ages trawling through all of my stitch dictionaries and I found it and it's actually in one of the Barbara Walker books. I found it in there. And I compared the two and some of the stitches were different. And I understood the ones in the Barbara Walker much more than the ones in the Japanese one. So what I did was I created my own motif using a combination of the two uh, patterns in the two books and I love it and let me tell you it is challenging it absolutely is challenging some of the stitches are quite intense let's say I haven't I haven't made any mistakes on it and I'm really really enjoyed knitting this motif so what I decided to do because it is challenging 
I didn't want to do it all over. I thought, right, that's just a bit much. Let's just do a panel down each side of the leg and that's what I'm doing. So here is where I'm up to. I'm up to the heel flap now. Can you see, it looks like a little moon. When it's actually blocked, it will block out a bit. You'll be able to sort of see the roundness a bit more. Let me just get my hand in and see if that helps. There we go. Can you see? I think it looks, well, I think you can interpret it in various ways. I think it looks a bit like a moon, which is how I've interpreted it. I also think it looks like candle flames running down. I also think it looks like Christmas baubles, like a string of Christmas baubles. So I like that you can actually interpret it in different ways. And I've loved knitting it. You know, I love things that are a bit a bit out of the norm. You know, some of the stitches I've never done in my life. <laughs> but it's great fun doing these things you've never done before and then seeing what you've created from doing those. Because I had no clue what it was going to look like. Because sometimes you see, you see things in stitch dictionaries and you do it and I think it looks nothing like what's in there. And I had no idea whether this was going to work because I'd, I'd swapped some of the stitches. But I, I just think it's just brilliant. I love it. So this is really going to push on people's lace technique. Then. Well, I think so. You know, it's got a lot of basic lace stitches in there, but it's also got some lace stitches which are definitely, like I said, much more intense. And you're going to do a series of all through every I'm going step. to do the, yeah. So within the tutorial, we will, I think there'll be six parts to it. So we'll cast on together. So I'm doing a contrast cuff, heel and toe. That will all be within the tutorial. And then obviously I'm going to be working through that stitch pattern as well quite closely just to show you exactly how to do those very particular stitches, you know, as well as just your standard lace stitches. So because this looked like, I thought it looked like a moon, the yarn, I went into my stash and I thought, right, I'm going to choose yarns that look sort of moonish. And I found two yarns and then one of the yarns, actually, I stole the name of the colourway and made it the name of the design because it just fit. So the contrast colour, and this also fit with the theme, is another Cascade Heritage and this is Lunar Rock moons, lunar rock, brilliant. So that's the cup, that will be cuff, heels and toes. And the main colour, oh that nearly dropped on the floor, is this one, which is like a creamy colour but it's got a lot of grey in it. If I show you the other side, can you see all of the grey that's in there? And it tones so beautifully well with the cuff. It's another Eden Cottage. This one is called Moonstruck. So these are the Moonstruck socks. And these will be within that tutorial that will be running May, June time. Brilliant. And that'll just fit beautifully with the current yeah. sock tutorials that we've got out there, which is just great. Yeah. So I'm knitting through one sock. I think this one is the right sock. And then I will do the tutorial on the other sock. Brilliant. <clears throat> and I'll just explain the differences and where you place your panel, basically, cool. for each sock. So excited about that. Cool! Right, it's time for some action. Who's ready to head back to Northumberland and Hadrian's Wall? Me! Although it's a little bit rich, isn't it, I think, me saying Hadrian's Wall, because on our first walk, you didn't, didn't even see even a see tiniest it. bit of it. He, we diddled, we feel diddled. Well, that's about to change in rather dramatic fashion as we head back for another walk in the wall. Welcome everyone to Northumberland. This is perhaps my favourite county in all of England. 
rolling hills make some absolutely wonderful vistas and, and gorgeous landscapes to look out on. And scattered in between those hills are some of the most unique and unforgettable little villages. In this series, over seven walks, we're exploring Hadrian's Wall, the epic monument built by the Romans nearly 2,000 years ago to mark the edge of their vast empire. And my goodness, they did it in style. On our first walk, we already discovered the vast Phalum Hadriani. This was the ditch which protected the south side of the 73 mile wall, which once stretched from the east coast to the west coast. We also took a walk up St Oswald's Way, the 97 mile trail which connects Holy Island with Heavenfields. After avoiding the winter weather, which can be pretty dramatic in Northumberland, we're back on the Hadrian's Wall path. And after visiting the site of Onham Fort on our first walk, this time we're gonna take things up a notch because just take a look at this. This is a show about Hadrian's Wall, and I think it's time it made an appearance. Welcome to Walking the Wall. everyone to Northumberland. We've moved about seven miles west from the site of our first walk. The village of Acom lies to our south, the hamlet of Colliford lies to our north, but really around here there's not much but amazing views and loads of superb Roman archaeology. We're starting our walk today on the Hadrian's Wall path. That's the trail which runs the whole length of the wall right across the country. Now, I'm very excited to tell you today that actually the aforementioned wall, Hadrian's Wall, is actually gonna start to make an appearance on today's walk. Yes, after teasing you last time with the amazing Valum and also the site of Onham Roman Fort, today we're actually gonna get to see the main attraction. Hadrian's Wall itself. It's time for us to sink our teeth into some tangible, visible and rather exciting Roman archaeology. On our walk today, we're gonna to head west along the line of Hadrian's Wall. We're gonna come face to face with a vast bridge abutment. We'll then take a bit of a look at Salernum Roman Fort. And then we're gonna head north. We're gonna follow the river up before then turning back sort of southeast again. 
when we're going to walk straight through a really famous battlefield actually known today as Heaven Fields. I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Right now though, it's time for us to do some serious walking. Now, Hadrian's Wall was actually made up of three elements. There was the vallum, which we discovered on our first walk. There was the wall, which we're gonna see today, but there was also the defensive ditch. That was right in front of the wall itself, and we're walking along the line of where the wall once stood now. So that defensive ditch there tells us that the wall used to be here. But the reason why I'm so excited is, it's the first time in, in my recollection, in my life, that I've ever seen that defensive ditch. And just imagine if you were an invading army coming from the north, coming to attack Hadrian's Wall, you'd have a 15 foot high wall, but then also you'd have a six foot ditch with what's called in the bottom an ankle breaker. It's like a, a square channel, which is designed to catch your ankles and stop you moving forward would have been quite the feat, wouldn't it, to come and attack this wall. Amazing. One of the easy mistakes to make when you're on a walk like this, when we're in search of that first tantalizing glimpse of Hadrian's Wall, is to not enjoy the journey. Because would you believe that we're walking through the site of a special, the site, a site of special scientific significance? That's hard to say. Now, why is that important? Well, Hadrian's Wall might be 2,000 years old, but the landscape we're walking through has rock formations which were formed 326 million years ago. This is one of those moments that gets me so excited about history. Because if we traveled back in time 2000 years, the wall would be right here. It'd be pretty bustly actually, because the sort of hint of a fort is on the horizon. So there have been lots of soldiers. There may even have been some locals looking for a way across. So it would have been bustling with activity. Little did they know that beneath their feet, was something millions of years older than them that just gets paleontologists actually. It's paleontologists that love it. So Ross from Friends would love it here. They get really excited about that amazing fossilized reef. It's just tremendous, isn't it? To think that no matter how far back you look with history, you can always go one step further. The story never ends.
we're not here to see fossils. We've come in search of Roman archaeology and after a whole walk where there was really a lot of imagination going on, wasn't there? We could only really see earthworks. It's about to get serious. Because yes, whilst behind me, there are every so often, there's little fragments of wall. There's nothing really of note. But that is about to change. Because just up here, and I can see it just on the horizon, just up here is the first serious section of Hadrian's Wall. And from here, it starts to rise before us as we cross Northumberland. So this really is the start of it. This is where things really do begin to get quite exciting. I've got to say, it feels like Christmas. And it's the same for my family too. When we get close to Hadrian's Wall, there's this sort of feeling of excitement. So if I can find my way across General Wade's military road, we can take a look at the first proper section of wall in this series. William Hutton actually wrote about it afterwards. He said, 20 miles west of Newcastle, I should have found a stretch of wall unlike any other along the whole line. Standing seven feet high and running 200 feet long, it should have taken my breath away. But on arrival, a workman was taking it down. I spoke to the proprietor and the boss of the workman and I asked him to desist, or else he would ruin the whole body of antiquaries. I wish people still spoke like this. And thank goodness he did, because as it turned out, this is one of the most important sections of the wall. And I'll show you why, just look down here. What this shows us is just a short section into the building of the wall. The plan changed. They dropped it in width by two Roman feet, which saved time and resources. Now, there's lots of theories as to why this might have happened. Some people think maybe it was that they couldn't find enough stone. Well, I just don't believe that because there's so many rock faces and ancient mines around this area. I think it's got everything to do with speed. I think that original section had taken just too long to build, and they knew that by dropping the width of the wall, they could get Hadrian's Wall up and running much faster. It does raise the question, why was Hadrian's Wall built in the first place? Now, Emperor Hadrian clearly wanted to put down his marker in the sand and show to everyone where the Roman Empire ended and barbarian country began. But 10 miles north of here, there's a Roman fort and it's one of many, it's called Bucastle. And it was in use for 224 years after the wall was built. So I think Hadrian's Wall was more of a last line of defense. But also, I think it was a means of generating money. 
not only for the building of the construction of the wall, which obviously costs money, but also as a way of getting taxes for the Roman Empire. So I think they sped up the building so it could pay for itself all the quicker. wondering what that ditch is over my left shoulder. Yes, it is the Vallum, which we discovered on our first walk. We've just had a slightly frustrating jaunt. We're still actually on it now, along the military road, which is so busy, it's really annoying. But it was only a short little bit, thank goodness, and I was doing it to cut a corner so we could get somewhere rather special. Because just up here, we're gonna pick up an old railway line, and it's gonna lead us down to something which I've wanted to see since I was 10. This is what I'm talking about. Just a short distance from that road, because we've dropped down, all the noise has gone, it's marvelous. Wow, look at this. There's the railway line. It's now a farmer's track. I'm walking right along next to it. And whilst it's really sad that the trains aren't here anymore, it's opening up to us a part of the wall that's really easy to forget. Because as we already know, Hadrian's Wall travels 73 miles straight across the country. And on its way across the country, the eight foot wide, 10 foot high wall has to cross many obstacles. And perhaps the most challenging of all those obstacles were the many rivers, and there really are loads of them. Thankfully though, the Romans were old hands at dealing with river crossings. And down here is a pretty vast, it's what's called a bridge abutment, that I first saw when I was 10. And if I was to say I'm excited about getting up close to it today, well, as you can see, I'm extremely excited. Ladies and gentlemen, 
this really is it. This is a red letter day in this series because after a walk and a half of some fairly interesting things, we finally hit something that gets me very excited. And you might be wondering why that is. Well, I'm gonna tell you, if you take a look at this, this is Hadrian's Wall and it comes piling up here it's obviously started right over here on the east coast and down it comes on its way to the west coast. So it comes straight down here on its way to the River Tyne, which it's going to need to cross. But before we get to the River Tyne, we've actually got a guard tower, which would have been manned by guards, allowing people to get across the bridge that then took them across and on further up Hadrian's Wall. It's such an impressive thing. I think the thing that you've got to remember though is Hadrian's wall was seriously heavy. Eight foot wide, ten foot tall, this needs a serious amount of engineering to support it coming across the river and that's what we find over here. This is it. These huge stones that I'm stood on top of were laid in 160 AD to support the second bridge that used to cross right here at Chester's Roman Fort. My goodness, it is just unbelievable to stand on top of these and to see in them the markings that once used to hold the iron workings that used to then support all the structures that then came above. It's fascinating stuff. And when we come back in part two, we're gonna be discovering a little bit more of its story and a whole lot more besides. So while I catch my breath and grab something to eat, you guys head off for a little breather and I'll see you later in the show for more Walk in the Wall. What a place! I can't believe that we've literally been driving past all of this for all the times we've ever been to Hadrian's Wall. True. Because the place that you head for mm. is Housesteads. And we're yeah. going there on, on, you know, in this series. Yeah. You, you come sailing past all of this. Yeah. And you, you just don't even realise that it's there. And I think the thing that blew my mind the most was how amazing that William Hutton saved that section of wall. Absolutely, yeah. To yeah. see it go from 10 Roman feet to 8 Roman feet in that 200 foot, sec 200 foot section mm. is just mm. bonkers. Mm. And when I was there, I was trying to spot the house. And there's actually, the, there's, there's three houses all in the vicinity, mm. all that look like they've been built right. with Hadrian's Wall stone. And, you know, like we've already covered on this series, it was literally used as a mine, and it was yeah, only it was yeah. at this point yeah. where things started to change around about the sort of 19th century. It's mm. thanks to the Victorians, really, because mm. they got properly mm. into mm. their archaeology, didn't they? We've yeah. seen that on Time Team. Yeah, they had, there was loads of sort of antiquarians that used to call them then, didn't they? Yeah, I mean, some weren't very good at what they did, but at least... They were trying They were showing to. an interest, mm. yes. And I think that, that's the key, isn't it? That's the key to things being saved. What's so exciting is, in part two, we'll be actually looking a little bit at the, the man who really, it's thanks to him that any yeah. of this is left. Yeah. I sort of think of, him, think of him as the Beatrix Potter mm. of Hadrian's Wall, because mm. Beatrix Potter... It is sort of saved a lot of the Lake District. The yeah. Lake District is as it is because, because of what of she her. did. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Absolutely, it is amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. So yeah, when we come back, part two, there is a, absolutely we're, we're going to look really closely at the bridge abutment, but we're also mm. going to take a look at the fort opposite. We're then going to take a walk up the river and then head to the most amazing battlefield, oh. but then finish off at just the most picturesque church. Oh, it's beautiful. In the most amazing oh, it's place. beautiful, yeah. Gas yeah. lit. Yeah, amazing. No electricity. No electricity. I mean, is that not amazing? <sighs> Perfect. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. But right now, it's time for us to find out. And this is exciting. Excitement. Kay Jones, what's off your needles? I do have one thing. And the one thing is also a new design. And it's my Just Add Magic socks. I hadn't quite finished these the last time but they are now finished and the pattern is out there today. So it's brand, brand new. So it's these gorgeous socks. It's the ones with the lace panel just down the outside of the leg. 
And this is the colourway that I dyed up on the last uh, My Favourite Colourways. Amazing. So it's the Just Add Magic colourway and what I named afterwards, thanks to a viewer, the Magician's Assistant. Or as I call it, Debbie McGee. Debbie McGee. <laughs> I told the story of these socks actually originally, but I, I actually designed these socks probably two or three years ago. And I knit a pair for Bryony. I used a self-striping yarn and she's worn them and worn them and worn them. She loves them. And at the time, I just couldn't quite figure out how to make the rib flow into the lace panel. So I just shelved it. You know, I'd got all my notes still and I just shelved it and the time was right to revisit it and I quickly solved the problem of the ribbon and you can see how lovely that flows into the rib now. So I just customised the rib to allow to get that flow because I, I, do, I do really think it's important, it is important for me anyway, that the rib complements the design. I don't, so I don't other... like it just to be no. a rib and then you go into the design. Yeah. I, I see it as part of the design. Yeah. So sometimes it doesn't affect the pattern of the sock, what type of rib you do. But sometimes it's really important, and this was one of those times where it was important to get it to flow. So the rib on each sock, because the placement of the lace panel is in a different place on each sock. The rib for each sock is just slightly different as well. And that's obviously all detailed in the pattern, how to do that. And then yeah, you ju it just flows into this really pretty lace, which just looks so vintage for me. I just love that. It's classic, it's very classic. I do like designs actually that are classic designs. It's so cool think. to think as well though that you, you, you actually designed these years ago. A few years ago, yeah. Which is just yeah. so great. It's like looking back yeah. to where your sort of mind was mm, design wise mm, mm. a couple of years ago, but then adding in all of the things that the you've learned. The knowledge that I've gained. Yeah, yeah that's right. I mean, that, right. that's so exciting. That's right, yeah. And to then to just knit them up as well in yarn that, that I've dyed myself, just, you know, I was talking about the whole colour thing earlier. I just love, you know, this combination, this, the brightness and the fun, how fun it is. To, you know, sometimes I do love a subdued yarn for socks because it suits the design. You know, that's the other thing. I really want the yarn to complement the design. And so often, you know, I do see designs where the yarn for me is just entirely not right for the design. Either it disguises the design and you can't see it at all, or I just think the you know the colors take away from the design and I, for me it, it's it's a whole thing you know like I was talking about the rib you know I also think about what heel will be best what toe will be best will it be best to do contrast cuffs and toes or like the prom socks go for a, a you know a, a solid color all the way through the same color all the way through for me it's an entire package you know the the yarn has got to be right for the design the rib has got to be flowing into the design the heel and the toe have got to be right and it just all came together with this sock do you know what I, th I think you're missing one element which is the thing that i've heard you talk about the most with these and when i think about the projects that you've knitted over the years that you've enjoyed the most the thing that you talk about the most is the feel that you get when oh you're yeah knitting. i loved i loved knitting these socks and again the, the first one i knit in a literally a flash and then I, I got sidetracked with other designs and things I had to do that had deadlines so the second one had to sit there for a little bit but when I picked up the second one that one also I think I knit it in two days the, the whole sock I knit in two days because it just it's got that feel of you just like oh yeah just uh, one more repeat one more repeat and because you, you know you're just working on those few stitches and then you just get to whip round with stocking stitch because I'm always excited. I'm like, oh yeah, let's get back round now to do another bit of lace. It's just really potato chippy. That's what the words that everyone uses, isn't it? When it's that kind of feel. If only we called them potato chips in this country. We don't call. <laughs> we would have to say it's it's crisp like, crisp, which isn't crispy. Well, you can't say crispy, can you? Because we don't we don't call potato chips potato chips. Because a potato thing. chip is something that you have a potato with your fish. Yeah, a chip is something that a is chipped made, potato is made from chips. You have it with fish and chips. Or That's sausage the full name, chips. isn't it? Chipped potatoes. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Ch chips. 
it's chipped potatoes. Fish oh, right, with okay. chipped potatoes. All oh, right, okay, yeah. So a chip to us is not what a chip is in America. A chip in America is a crisp to us. Yes. Like a packet of crisps. So it's this not is a, crisp It's not knitting. a bag of chips. I quite it's... like that. This is crisp knitting. <laughs> crisp knitting. <laughs> it sounds like a description of the finished. It's crisp. Oh, it's crisp. Yes. <laughs> So, the Just Add Magic socks are now available on Ravelry and Love Crafts if you would like to purchase them and knit your own little bit of magic. I'm just thinking about uh, patterns and just about what you were talking about there. And, it, you know, it seems to me that knitting patterns are very similar to books. Each section is like a chapter. I suppose so. And if so. it doesn't flow through yeah, and all connect yeah, up right, yeah, yeah. then the feeling that you're inevitably going to get... Is yeah. not going to be no. I mean, of I, completeness. No, I, I've. I mean, I've designed many, many, many socks and ditched them, if you like, because it just something on them wasn't right. I get a feel when I know that's it. That something's right. You have. You've ditched loads of designs. Yeah, loads where and loads. You've just not felt no, right about it's it. It's just not been right, and I can't tell you what it is that makes something not right but I know when something's right and when something isn't and when something isn't yeah. right I just get that feeling and, and there was something definitely right yes yeah, these. <laughs> these these just felt right they and look I, just they're, they're gorgeous socks I can give these to Bryony now even more excitedly I've just yeah. realized I should really keep some the for myself, ultimate. but I just love giving socks to Brian. But she's, she's the just, ultimate. She's the most. She is the most. She appreciates sock worthy person I know. I don't think there might be anyone in the world who no. appreciates them as much as she. She does. loves her hand knitted socks, like you know, loves them, and she chooses a pair that matches her outfit. You know, she's like, "Oh, I've got these on today because of this." It might not be anything related to what she's wearing, but you know, she's been reading a book, or she saw this, or. You know, she always does something to match her socks to something that's going on in her brain. And I yeah. think that's just lovely. So, yeah, she will love these. Speaking of hand-knitted socks, I was wearing hand-knitted socks when I was out walking the wall. In <laughs> fact, whenever I'm doing any walk, in fact, whenever I'm doing anything other than running, I'm always wearing hand-knitted socks. Mm -hmm. But woolen socks for walking long distances mm -hmm. are Oh, I think that's Perfection. I think that's a known. Yeah, fact, isn't I would it? never have believed it. No, I, you know, you would think that you need like a specific, like you know, a, you, a light cotton sock or whatever. Well, also you go into shops, so you're walking socks and yeah. you know all sorts of man-made fibres. Man-made fibres. Yeah, I would avoid man-made fibres. Total fibers. rubbish. Yeah, total yeah. rubbish. Yeah. They're just phenomenal. They sort of keep you airy mm -hmm. and supported and just amazing. It's all the properties of wool, isn't yes. it? Wool's amazing. Speaking yeah. of walking. I think it's time that we got back yes. for the second part Ooh, yes, of Walking love the it. Wall. Welcome back everyone to Salernum Bridge Abutment. What a perfect day it is actually to take in some blooming outstanding Roman archaeology. Now, one of the hardest things to do when you're looking at something like this is to imagine what it would have looked like when it was brand new. But with the help of Stuart the drone, who's flying just up there, I think we can help you with that a little bit. Oh, 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 oh,
Now the eagle eyed of you might have noticed in that reconstruction that just over the bridge there's something rather impressive. And this is a little bit special for me folks because you may recall on our first walk I told you a story about a visit that I took about 35 years ago. And that visit set me off on a lifelong love of not just Roman history, but of history as a whole. And the place that I visit, would you believe it, was Salernum Roman Fort, just over the river right here. Now, I remember vividly walking around the fort and then coming down to the bathhouse and staring across at this very bridge abutment that we're at now, not thinking that you could actually get down here. To be back here all these years later, it's surreal, but I've got to say, it's absolutely lovely too. The later history of Salernum actually brings up a really important historical point because many history books will tell you that in the 5th century, round about 400 AD, the Romans just upped and left England. The problem is they never actually left. All that happened was the orders that were coming from Rome and the money to pay the salaries of the soldiers and all the people who lived and worked in the Roman Empire stopped coming in. So everyone was just left to fend for themselves. So pretty much in all of the forts along the line of the wall, and the story is you know, by and large the same across the country, the forts still had the same soldiers in. And you sort of, well, Archaeology tells us they never left, so you sort of imagine that they just carried on doing what they were doing and maybe wondered what they should do and over a certain amount of generations, slowly but surely, the soldiers probably died out and their families probably moved away because certainly in the case of Salernum of Chester's, gradually the fort became a ruin and disappeared under the ground. The funny thing is, Salernum's story was far from over. Because in 1771, the land was bought. Now by this time, it was pretty much completely covered over. And the people who bought it covered over what was left. And on top of it, they built a house. And back then, it was traditional to name your house. And this grand country house was given the name of Chester's. In 1832, it was inherited by a man called John Clayton. And one day he was digging in his garden and he found Salernum. Now, because his house was called Chester's, Salernum Fort came to be known and it is to this day as Chester's Roman Fort. 
But back to John Clayton, because as he uncovered this fort, he became hooked on what he found and he excavated it all. And once he'd finished the fort, he, well, it was obvious to him that it was connected to something. So he started buying up more and more sections of land, excavating what was there and also preserving what was left. And it's actually thanks to John Clayton that there's any wall left at all, because if he hadn't done what he'd done, all of it would have been robbed out. And we might know nothing of what we do today because we've learned so much from the, the inscriptions that he found. There's actually a museum at Chester's Fort with loads of stone from the fort that he kept and displays in the museum. And it's from those inscri in, in, inscriptions that we've learned so much about the soldiers that were based here and also some of the stories that were connected with these forts. Now then, we've actually left Salernum far behind us, down the river and the bridge abutment. And we're making our way along one of Great Britain's newest walking trails. This is the River Tyne Trail. This is also actually one of the most populated routes which we'll do in this series. And one of the biggest settlements is just across the river over there. It's called Humshof. It's not written that way. I hope I've pronounced that right. But yeah, Humshof is just over there. And it's got an absolutely fascinating link to the scout movement. It's not actually something I've ever been interested in scouting, but it's spread across the world, hasn't it, the scouting movement? Today, there's 940,000 scouts in England. There's five million scouts in the USA, but I bet you, you can't guess the country that's got the most scouts in the world is Indonesia. There's 25 million of them. That's amazing, isn't it? Going out into the wilds and adventuring. And to think it all started pretty much right here. But when I look around, you can sort of see why. My goodness, that really has been quite the climb. We've come up 180 meters since we left the River Tyne Trail. And we're actually walking straight through barbarian country. We're heading south now, back towards Hadrian's Wall. And just imagine if I'd been a Celtic horde, I would have had to have run up this hill before coming face to face with Hadrian's Wall itself. It's no wonder that there's only four recorded times in the history of the wall when it was actually attacked and taken over. It was actually in the years after 
the Roman Empire retracted from England, that there was more battles here. And one of the most famous of all those battles took place just up here. King Oswald actually placed his army facing east and Hadrian's wall at the time was still standing to its full height so his right flank was protected by Hadrian's wall and his left flank was actually protected by Brady Crag. It's a really high peak just over to my left. It's full of marshland and what that meant that the Welsh army, the invading Welsh army couldn't come up on him either side. They couldn't flank him. They could only come and meet him head on. The funny thing is though, it wasn't actually a battle between Christians and pagans because there was just as many Christians and pagans fighting for Oswald as there was fighting for the Welsh army. It was actually the work that Oswald would go on to do with Aidan, with the founding of Holy Island and the work that he would do to spread Christianity across Northumbria this just really became the sort of touchstone. This was the point where his sort of rise happened. And what better way to celebrate Oswald's rise than with the building of a church? This place is just gorgeous. I love the candles in the walls which are clearly used and the gas lamps above. Can you imagine this place at Christmas with the candles going, the gas lamps on, singing carols. And then at the end, we find another Roman altar, amazing.
What an absolutely wonderful way to finish today's walk. In the shadow of a church built on the site of a pretty brutal battlefield, just a stone's throw from Hadrian's Wall. And what a walk this has been. These archaeologists have found the original church, which was built in around 650 AD. In the ground all around that site of the, the church that stands there now, and the stone that they found was stone taken from Hadrian's Wall, which would have laid just a few feet behind where you are right now. It's poetry, isn't it? The stone of the wall used in the building of this wonderful church, which still remains to this day. It's been a walk for the ages, I think, but let me tell you, we're only just getting started, because when I see you next time, how about the longest section of continuous wall in all of Northumberland? Yes, if you're looking for Hadrian's Wall, as far as the eye can see, you will have come to the right place. But that's all for next time. All that's left for me to do today is to thank you so much for joining me on this wonderful walk, and I'll see you next time for more Walking the Wall. What a walk! I mean, I absolutely stand by what I said at the end of that walk. That is a walk for the absolute ages, and I'm going to take you there, mm -hmm. because I'm not kidding you, I have found a new favourite place. Oh, brilliant. That area around that church... Is there a picnic site? There, there's seats. Because we have to have a picnic site. There's seats. Round the seats up in the churchyard, right. the seats also on the outside oh, of the right, churchyard. Okay. I love a churchyard, but that walk from the church along to plane trees and then down to the bridge abutment mm. I mean, specifically, the walk from the church to plane trees is Nothing. tremendous. Mm. It's got absolutely everything that you would want, and it's only short. You know, if you did that walk there and back, it's probably a mile and a half. Oh, it's not very far, is it? It's not far at all. It's perfect no. for a little jaunt out yeah, and, yeah. And, and an explore. Yeah, and a little picnic. And the other thing as well that's blowing my mind now, I mean, I said to you the other day, I can now speak through experience because I've obviously done extensive walks in the Dales, done, you know, a good few walks in the Moors, and now, you know, we're, we're, we're second walk in in Northumberland and, and Hadrian's Wall, and the winner by a country mile is Northumberland. And I, I can't quite put my finger on exactly no. why. The Yorkshire Dales is extremely picturesque. If you're looking for sort of mm. picture postcard, mm. chocolate box mm. type views. Yeah. But do you know what? When I see those, they don't seem quite real to me. It seems all, of, I don't I know. Think because the Yorkshire Dales is used such a lot... For Maybe it's overly seen and things like that. Yeah, and it's also I would say it's quite a busy tourist county as yes. well. Yes, yes. Actually, when we were talking the other day, what I said to you was the people walking in the moors are very friendly. The people walking in the dales aren't. Well, it could because it's a lot of tourists, and that's what you said. Yeah, they're not locals. Yeah, yeah. But Northumberland. The funny thing is, I. I I've not seen a lot of people, so that no, might well, be one of the reasons. Northumberland is the least populated county in the country. And also, it's the least visited of all the national yeah. parks. I, don't understand, I don't understand why more people don't visit Northumberland. I really don't. To stay away. But yeah, yeah, no, don't go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's true. No, don't go. <laughs> it's, it's rubbish. Yeah, it's total rubbish. You won't like any of it. <laughs> what I found is... In all the years, I mean, it may be because we're so on a subject which I know about, mm. but of all the things I've ever planned, these have been different in the sense of it's not 
I don't have to look for stories. Mm. What you're looking for is the stuff to leave out. Because mm. there's mm. literally so much mm. that, you know, you want to sort of get across. Take Chester's Fort, for example. You could film probably two or three mm. hour-long shows there. And the funny thing is, we did we film did. something there. We did. In 2015. Yeah, yeah, we did. And we've actually just re-edited it and, and put it out as part mm. of our... Mm. Favorite places to knit revisited series, mm. and you know it, it just shows you that all these places have got so much depth. There's so much to discover. It's just marvelous. Mm. I love Northumberland. Mm. Walking the wall. It's going away for one episode. Don't worry. Yeah. No winter weather. It's not going to be disappearing for no. six or eight weeks. Walking the wall will be back next month. Yeah. But next episode, it's time for another gorgeous colorway. And you've already. Did you say what you're doing? I did. Yes. I already told you. Hobbitland. I'm doing Hobbitland. Oh, yes. I will also talk about that colourway that I've used as well for yeah. the Prom Queen socks. Yes. Because I use the same colours. So my favourite colourway is going to be back next time. It's going to be absolutely marvellous because it's a re- it, you People requested Hobbitland, didn't they? Yes. I think it was on our last pop show. Yes. Yes. I think so. And actually, that's a perfect transition to our Envy Bits. Because yes. our, bits. our pop show is on Sunday. It is. It's Mother's yes. Day. Mother's Day on Sunday yes. in this country, everyone. It's our Mother's Day pop show. Yes. And it's going to be lovely because at the start of the year, we welcomed our first oh, guest yes. on the pop show. And that was our disability editor, Jen. And Jen, in that little guest appearance, people got very excited about her craft room. So Jen has promised us that she's going to take us for a little tour of her craft yes. room. It's pink. Yeah. In in our it's our hour long monthly patron only exclusive show, and that's coming out on Sunday live on Sunday British summer time. Oh no! Yeah, I've sorry. So two p.m. British summer time. But I think what a lot of I've people forgotten. don't realise is after the show's gone out live, then it's available to watch any time you like. And not only that, all the pop shows that we've ever put out are available to watch any time you like. So there's, I mean, there's at least 36, 36 mm-hmm. hour long shows, which are similar but different to this. They are different because they're live, you know, so it, it does have a different feel and we're chatting back and forth to people. It's lo- yeah. I love doing pop. It's one of my favourite things to do. I love I it. I find it slightly more stressful just because it's live and there's like I a know. million things going yeah, on. Yeah, you, Dan does all the technical stuff. I just sit there and talk about knitting and have a laugh. So. <laughs> yeah, it is slightly uh, yeah. challenging just because it's live, but that you know that's what makes it fun. But yes, there's uh, there's absolutely loads of pop shows to go at. So if you are a, a Baker Bear patron at any level, yeah. you can access loads and loads and loads of our pop shows, and I'll put the link to where you can find all of those in our show notes below. Yeah. You bought something. I've just got one thing to show you, and I bought. I recently had to buy some more undyed yarn for you know my favourite colourways. And I thought for a change, I would buy some DK weight and dye up some DK weight. And I've got a different base and it's absolutely lovely. But I get my undyed yarn, I get asked this question a lot. And I get it from a place where you can actually buy it in smaller quantities. You don't have to buy like commercial size quantities. Um, And I get it from a company called Yarn Undyed that's here in the UK. And they do ship worldwide. I'm pretty sure on their website it says they ship worldwide. But the one I, I got, you can so you can buy you, you can buy single skeins as well. But I buy five packs. So I've got this five pack of DK weight, and this is a hundred percent merino. Let me just take one out. But it's a super fine merino. It's super wash, but it's an sorry extra fine, and it's a nineteen point five micron DK weight. And it's so soft and lovely. It's really butter. It's it's really it's buttery soft. I mean, it would just be so gorgeous for a blanket. I always say that, don't I? But baby knits, it would be gorgeous. It's so beautiful. And I've not dyed on this before, so I think I'm going to dye up Hobbitland on this and see how it comes out. It's just gorgeous. So if you are looking for some undyed yarn, then I would really recommend this company, Yarn Undyed. The service is fantastic. I order and I get it within a day or two at the most. It always comes with nice delivery men. Yeah, brilliant company. I forgot to mention actually, speaking of our knitability editor, Jen, 
new issue of Visibility is out now. Wow. There is a, just the best interview ever with the designer Sarah Solomon. If you're looking for amazing colour work and also the cable jumpers, I think it's called a pastoral sweater or something or other. It's right. along those lines. It's the most gorgeous looking cable sweater right. I have ever seen. It's stunning. But she's got tons and tons of amazing designs. Fantastic. Interview with Sarah Solomon. Also an interview with Michelle from Studio at the Green who oh. makes lovely bags yeah. and also dyes some gorgeous super speckly yarn. Plus all the usual features I'm, articles from Kay. I wrote an article. Congratulations. <laughs> That, that is yeah, an achievement look, in itself. Look, that alone needs, From the lady yes. who said a few years ago, I think I should do a blog. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, thankfully, I, you have a husband who knows you who said, what are I you always, talking about? I just about? always struggle when it comes to writing. I don't know. But anyway, I did write an article and I wrote a part two of my planner journey article. So this is the planner I'm using, it's the whys, it's the wherefores, it's why I'm not using the Hobonichi, I'm sorry. And after this, there's no more planner talk. No. No. <laughs> and I wrote about how on earth did I get here? How on earth did I become the man who could identify taffeta? Ah, oh, right. It was a very interesting journey actually. Right. Because I slotted some things into place in my head and actually it all makes sense. Yeah. So oh. knitability is out right now. But that's it, folks. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everyone. As I mentioned earlier, we will be back in yeah. two weeks with another video show and a brand new My Favourite Colourways, which yes. is going to be amazing. Yes. But thank you so much for watching. Thanks, everyone. Have and we'll a lovely see you soon two with weeks. More. Bye. 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 Take you to fabulous places of which their favorites they'll share. You better buy a pad and get yourself a bakery pair. You'll find yourself in a castle while watching the bakery pair. It never feels like a hassle to sit and watch the bakery pairs. What's on your shelf or what's in your